What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Hi, this is Scott. If you're a fan of the ancient world, please help us get the word out. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and rate the series on iTunes. Thanks again for listening. The Ancient World Bloodline Episode B-15 God of the Mountain For billions and billions of years, longer than any time span humans could imagine, there was nothing but stillness and silence. But change being the nature of things, the day finally came when it began to feel the pull. Soon, the gentle grip was stronger than prison shackles. It was a victim of physics, of trajectory and mass, and its fate had finally been decided. But that didn't mean it had to go down quietly. Engulfed in a nimbus of heat and light, it gathered more speed as it fell. It was burning away, losing more of itself with each passing moment. Then, far below, another surface, and the end of its long journey. The meeting, when it came, was cataclysmic. An explosion not so different from an atom bomb. Were there humans there to see it? Probably not. But if there were, the light, the heat, the sound would have been incomprehensible. And in their wake, a smoking crater gouged into the earth, as large as a village or town. How could it be anything but a punishment sent by the gods? And how much more time passed days, years, millennia, before someone first came across the stone. A simple herdsman or migrant would have likely been astonished and rushed to tell their elders of the find. It'd be the second group, priests or big men with warriors in tow, who'd examine the object in detail and speculate on its origins. Whether lying exposed in a crater or thrown miles from the point of impact, all we know for sure is what they found. A massive black stone, taller than a man, wide at one end and narrow at the other, with a surface bearing markings and odd projecting features. How could it be anything but a gift sent by the gods? At some point, By some means, the stone was taken from its resting place, to begin its new role as an object of worship. Before long, two strong connections were made. Whether humans had seen it appear to issue from the sun, or the reasons were more complex, the stone became associated with the Mesopotamian sun god Shamash. And since the stone was taken to a high place to bring it closer to the gods, it was from a mountain that the object took its name. Elagabal, the god of the mountain, later known to the Romans as Elagabalus. A third association would also come in time, linking Elagabalus with an Arab tribe called the Emesenes. The Emesenes entered the historical record in the mid-2nd century BC through their dealings with the ruling dynasty of Syria, the Seleucids. What was the state of Syria at the time? Well, without recapping all of Seleucid history, it's probably worth bullet-pointing the previous 50 years. The Mid-Orontes region had long served as the effective line of skirmish between the Seleucids, based in Antioch, and the rival Ptolemies, based in Alexandria. Resonantly, at least to me, it's also the place where the Egyptians and Hittites had faced off a thousand years earlier at the Battle of Kadesh. 
Anyway, in 200 BC, the Seleucid king Antiochus the Great soundly defeated Ptolemaic forces and took firm control over the Levant, which just happened to render the Mid-Orontes a more stable region for migrating tribes to settle in. The next few decades saw Rome defeat Antiochus at the Battle of Magnesia and the successful revolt of the Maccabees against his son. These losses combined to fracture Seleucid dominance and create opportunities for emerging local powers. Among these were the Emesenes, a nomadic tribe based near the city of Apamea on the Orontes. In 150 BC, an Emesene chieftain named Iamblichus offered to shelter the son of Alexander Ballus, a prince seeking to overthrow the current Seleucid monarch. Ballus's success in claiming the throne, and even managing to hold it for a few years, served to enhance the fortunes of his Emesene backers. The Seleucid hold on Syria was further weakened by the invasions of first the Armenians under Tigranes the Great, and then the Romans under Pompey the Great. Interestingly, when Pompey decided to put an end to the Seleucid dynasty, he used Emesene chieftains as his hatchet men. On Pompey's orders, an Emesene ruler named Samsi Garamus murdered the last Seleucid king, Antiochus XIII Asiaticus, in 64 BC. The next year, another Emesene chief named Azizus killed the king's pseudo-successor, the hopefully named Philip II Philoromaeus, or Rome lover. And, well, that was pretty much the end for the Seleucids. Emesene loyalty did not go unnoticed. Even as he set up the new Roman province of Syria, Pompey elevated Samsi Garamus from tribal chieftain to client king, the first commissioned on the desert fringes. Back in Rome, Cicero even nicknamed Pompey Samsi Garamus to mock his eastern kingmaking. But for the real Samsi Garamus, his new title was no joke. And, where the Emesenes had previously been fine living in tents and migrating up and down the Orontes, he decided they now needed a suitable capital. The site he chose was a hilltop town along the mid-Orontes named Arethusa. From Arethusa, Samsigarimus ruled over a territory stretching both up and down the Orontes and east and west toward the coast and desert. Their location gave the Emesenes control over important trade routes, which soon brought them even more wealth. Emesene territory was mainly bounded by Roman Syria and Phoenicia. Only in the desert to the east did it border another territory, at a spot clearly marked by a boundary stone. The Eastern Kingdom, founded by a confederation of four Arab tribes, was called Tadmor in Arabic, but known to the Greeks as Palmyra. And yes, I have a helpful map up on the Ancient World website. Several miles to the northeast, at Shmemis, Samsigarimus marked his good fortune Bond villain style by erecting a palace atop an extinct volcano. Along with royal splendor and housing for his warriors, the palace afforded unobstructed views of his entire domain. It also brought him closer to his deity Shamash. In fact, the king's name, Samsi Garamus, translates to the sun god is venerated. The next step for the ambitious monarch was the creation of a new capital from scratch. Unlike Arethusa, which had been an ancient Syrian settlement before being renamed and repurposed by the Seleucids, the new capital would be Emesene from the start. Of course, he didn't want to stray too far from their current, very lucrative location, so it was just a few miles upriver that Samsigiramis founded the future capital of Emesa. Emesa modern Homs in Syria, was sited at the head of a gorge in the center of a fertile lowland plain, a prime location for agriculture as well as trade.
Its sighting also provided Emesa with a milder, almost Mediterranean climate and higher rainfall than other cities of the region. At some point, a dam was built across the Orontes and the water used to improve irrigation. Once the new town was up and running, Samsigirimus sent his son, Prince Iamblichus, to govern it, while he remained behind in Arethusa. Upon his death in 48 BC, Iamblichus became king, and Emesa became the Emesene capital. This happened to be the same year as both the death of Pompey the Great and the birth of our old friend Juba II. In Pompey's wake, the Emesenes threw their support behind Julius Caesar, sending warriors to relieve him when he was besieged in Alexandria. Interestingly, the forces were sent not only by King Iamblichus of Emesa, but also by two other Emesene princes named Sohamus and Ptolemy. These princes were based in the southern region of Chalcis, in the fertile Baca Valley near the headwaters of the Orontes. Also interestingly, one translation of the name Sohamus is black or precious stone. So, file that little factoid away for later. In Chalcis, the Emesene prince Ptolemy was succeeded by his son Lysimius in 40 BC. But then, well, Mark Antony decided to make some changes. I know what you're saying, that's certainly not the Mark Antony I know. Anyway, Antony killed Lysimius and gave the territory to his girlfriend, Queen Cleopatra of Egypt. After she died, in 30 BC, Chalcis reverted to Emesene control under Lysimius' son, Xenodorus. Back up north, when the civil war broke out, the Emesene king Iamblichus backed Octavian. This decision eventually cost him both his reign and his life, when he was murdered on the eve of Actium by his brother and Antony's ally, Alexis. Of course, fortune is a fickle mistress, and Alexis soon found himself arrested, paraded, and executed by a victorious Octavian. As mentioned back in episode B3, Alexis was the only foreign king paraded in Octavian's Actium triumph, and the only one killed in its aftermath. So, at least he got to die feeling special. After the deaths of Iamblichus and Alexis, Octavian put the Emesenes under Syrian control. But this appears to have been a holding action while he waited for a suitable heir to come of age. In 20 BC, Octavian put the son of Iamblichus on the Emesene throne as Iamblichus II. The new king had been raised in Rome, and was also the first Emesene king to hold Roman citizenship. As fate would have it, both Iamblichus II and Octavian died in the same year, 14 AD. For his successor, the Romans chose a royal relative, the grandson of the Emesene prince Xenodorus from the Baca Valley. He took the throne as Gaius Julius Samsigerimus II. As his name might suggest, the new king worked hand in glove with the Romans. An inscription from the Temple of Bel at Palmyra records how Samsigerimus supported Germanicus during his brief Eastern Imperium. It was also Samsigerimus who first began the pattern of Emesene intermarriage with local dynasties. For a wife, he chose Princess Iotapa, daughter of King Mithridates III of Comagene. The marriage was known to be a happy one and produced four children. Gaius Julius Azizus, Gaius Julius Sohamus, Iotapa, and Julia Mamaya. At around the same time, a royal relative gave birth to Julia Urania, the future wife of King Ptolemy of Mauritania. And yes, I took a stab at an Emesene family tree. It's up on the Ancient World website. In 41 AD, the southern Emesene territory of Chalcis was granted to a Judean prince by Claudius, and would be overseen by Judean royals for the next few decades. 
In 48 AD, Samsigirimus II died, and the Emocene throne fell to his eldest son, Gaius Julius Azizus, best known for his hasty circumcision and failed marriage to Herod Drusilla. But by 55 AD, when Drusilla of Mauritania arrived in Emesa, King Azizus had just died, and been succeeded by his younger brother, Gaius Julius Sohamus. And just so you don't miss the point, he also tacked on both Philo Caesar and Philo Romaius to the end of his name. Dude, we get it. You really, really like Rome. Relax, you're making us all nervous. So, what transpired when King Gaius Julius Sohamus Philo Caesar Philo Romaius set his eyes on our young, beautiful, and recently abandoned Drusilla of Mauritania, who also just happened to be the daughter of an Emocene royal and a relative of the current Roman emperor? Well, let's just say that rings were soon being sized, patterns picked out, and save the date cards dispatched by royal messenger. In 56 AD, in a joint Emocene, Roman, Comagenian, Egyptian, Numidian, Mauritanian style ceremony, okay, probably just Emocene, the couple was married, and our 18 year old Drusilla became Queen Drusilla of Emesa. Now, I previously mentioned that Sohamus's branch of the royal family hailed from the Baca Valley, south of Emesa, in the region known as Chalcis. Early in his reign, Sohamus became the patron of a Roman veterans colony established in the area. The colonized town had originally been Phoenician, but had been renamed Heliopolis, City of the Sun God, by Alexander the Great. We know the location as modern Baalbek in Lebanon. Sohamus' patronage was commemorated with an inscribed statue honoring both him and his father Samsigirimus II as great kings. But Emocene ties to Heliopolis may have gone deeper than patronage or even family. According to a theory proposed by archaeologist and historian Warwick Ball, the main temple at Baalbek, the one currently associated with Jupiter Hadad, is actually the Temple of Elagabal. Ball lays out a number of arguments. To start with, Ela Gabal, the god of the mountain, is a far better fit with mountainous Baalbek than lowland Emesa. Second, we know that the Emesenes held influence over the Baca Valley through several royals named Sohamus, or Black Precious Stone. Third, the Temple of Ela Gabal, also known as the Temple of Emocene Baal, was known to be one of the most majestic in the entire Roman East, yet not a single trace of it has ever been found. And lastly, the later Roman temple of Elagabalus, built by the emperor of the same name, is a virtual copy of Baalbek. Beyond that, I'll just point you to Baal's very interesting book, Rome in the East. If the theory's true, the Heliopolis branch of the royal family may have served as high priests of the sun god for generations, which would have made Samsigirimus II and his sons Azizus and Sohamus Emesa's first priest kings. The god they served, Ela Gabal, was symbolized by his cult object a large black stone that had fallen from the sky and was believed to reflect the nature of the sun. By the time of his marriage to Drusilla, the Romans had granted Sohamus control over a second eastern territory. The kingdom, Sophini, lay far to the north, bordering Armenia and near the headwaters of the Tigris. Nero may have granted it due to Sohamus' family ties to neighboring Comagene. But regardless, there was little mistaking what the emperor expected of him. Sohamus was to do whatever he could to help the Romans reclaim Armenia from the Parthians. When we last left Armenia, back in 37 AD, Caligula just deposed and imprisoned King Mithridates I the Iberian prince who'd conquered Armenia with Tiberius's backing. 
Mithridates was released and put back on the throne by Claudius in 42 AD. He then ruled Armenia until 51 AD, when he was overthrown by his nephew and son-in-law, an Iberian prince named Radamistus, which incidentally made Radamistus's wife the first Near Eastern queen named Zenobia. At around the same time, the on-again, off-again civil war in Parthia finally came to an end. In 47 AD, King Vardanes I was killed, and succeeded by his adopted brother, Gotarzes II. Gotarzes ruled for four very unpopular years before dying himself. He was then briefly succeeded by the aged King Venones II of neighboring Media, before he also died. This left Parthia in the hands of his son, Vologases I. And my wife always tells me I should flag the names you should pay attention to. So please remember the new Parthian king, Vologases. Vologases came to power in 52 AD, just as Radamistus was usurping the throne of Armenia. To the young and energetic Vologases, this meant Armenia was up for grabs. In 53 AD, Vologases invaded with a large Parthian army, captured the Armenian capital of Artaxata, and installed his younger brother on the throne as King Tiridates I. An unusually harsh winter led to a temporary Parthian withdrawal, and the brief reinstatement of Radamistus. But the next year, 54 AD, the Parthians returned to complete their takeover of Armenia. To Rome, this was a clear provocation, and a major test for the new emperor. As his point man, Nero chose the current governor of Asia, Gnaeus Domitius Corbulo. An experienced general and harsh disciplinarian, Corbulo was given imperium over Galatia and Cappadocia and control over the Syrian legions. In 55 AD, Corbulo negotiated a limited Parthian withdrawal from Armenia, one that Vologases only accepted since he needed to crush an internal revolt by his son Vardanes. The temporary stalemate left Tiridates in power, and the status of Armenia in limbo. Having bought himself some time, Corbulo went about building legionary strength and discipline. His novel methods included keeping Roman forces camped on the Anatolian plateau throughout the winter, to acclimate them to the harsh environment. This unpopular move was only mitigated by Corbulo's constant presence at their side, sharing their hardships and drilling them relentlessly to maintain their combat readiness. For the next two years, Vologases warred against his son, while Corbulo planned for the larger conflict to come. In addition to drilling his legions, Corbulo dispatched additional troops to man a line of forts along the Armenian frontier. He also called on the forces of local client kings, including Polymon II of Pontus, Aristibulus of Lesser Armenia, Antiochus IV of Comagene, and Pherosmenes of Iberia. And this is also when the newlyweds, King Sohamus and Queen Drusilla, were told to send Emesene soldiers to the Armenian border country of Sophene. In 58 AD, just as Vologases had put down his son's rebellion, another flared up in Hyrcania, near the Caspian Sea. With his troops now ready, and Vologases still tied up in the east, Corbulo decided the time was ripe to invade Armenia and expel Tiridates. As Roman and allied forces entered the country from multiple directions, a desperate Tiridates tried to negotiate. But talks collapsed before they even started, and Tiridates turned his attention to harassing Roman supply lines. But he quickly learned that Corbulo was no Mark Antony, and Parthian horsemen found their targets well guarded. Then it was Corbulo's turn, and he directed allied forces against Armenia's fortified strongholds. 
One by one they fell to his legions, and Corbulo massacred their surviving defenders. Slowly, inexorably, the Romans closed in on the Armenian capital of Artaxata, and Tiridates was forced to gather his armies and challenge their advance. When his horsemen were unable to break the Roman formation, Tiridates retreated back to the city, and then, well, out its back door. In his wake, Artaxata surrendered and was torched by the Romans, though this time its citizens were spared. The next year, 59 AD, Corbulo took the Armenian secondary capital of Tigranocerta with barely a fight. Around the same time, Vologases finally turned up along the southern border, but was repulsed by Roman auxiliaries. By the end of the year, the Romans were firmly in control, and installed their hand-picked king on the Armenian throne. Who was it? Well, remember Juba's second wife, Glaphyra, the great-granddaughter of Tigranes the Great? Remember her first husband, the strangled Judean prince Alexander? Remember how they had two sons together named Tigranes and Alexander? No? Well, anyway, Alexander had a son, now in his thirties, who took the Armenian throne as King Tigranes VI. To tie a nice bow around the whole affair, Corbulo gave Tigranes a thousand legionaries, three cohorts of auxiliaries, and some cavalry to defend his new kingdom. The general then took the rest of his legions back to Syria, where Nero promoted him to Roman governor. The royal contingents returned to their client kingdoms, with the gratitude of Nero and Rome. Who knows, maybe Sohamus and Drusilla even threw a nice parade for the returning Emesene troops. Either way, by 60 AD, the new Roman emperor had scored his first big foreign policy win. And, closer to home, Nero had also streamlined his administration by, well, killing his overbearing mother, Agrippina Minor. Yes, indeed, the 6th decade AD looked to be shaping up nicely. Word even came of a new foreign territory annexed to the imperial fold. Upon the death of their king, Prasutagus, the lands of the Iseni, in far-off Britannia, had been given to Rome. Well, okay, they'd actually been willed to Nero in conjunction with Prasutagus' two daughters, but Roman officials had ignored that part, had the daughters raped and plundered their lands. They'd also had their mother, Prasutagus' widow, publicly whipped to discourage any resistance. Yes, it's unlikely the Romans would have any further trouble with Queen Boudicca.